بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters for now lesson number 21 on Provisions for the Seekers, Introduction to Short Hadith for Youth. Inshallah, we ask Allah Taala to bless us in this session and to make this session solely for His sake and that He benefit us and all who are watching and all who will inshallah watch this and may Allah Ta'ala make this a Mubarak session of which there is great benefit to all, including myself and all of you and to our loved ones and may it Allah Ta'ala make this a means of rectification for the entire Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this lesson is titled "Kindness, Excellence, and Happiness." These are some of the topics that will come up, inshallah, in the hadith that we will cover, bidnillah. And inshallah, we'll go into the first hadith here for tonight. And this one is about seeing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It mentions Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. مَنْ رَآنِي فِي الْمَنَامِ فَقَدْ رَآنِي فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَا يَتَمَثَّلُوا بِي Whoever sees me in a dream has genuinely seen me because Satan cannot take my form. Now, this beautiful hadith is really a ishara and a, 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 a glad tiding for all Muslims that many have seen the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and many yearn to see him. And this has always been something that all Muslims yearn for. Everybody who has a love for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam yearns for this in their lifetime. We make du'a. We send salawat upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We try to follow his teachings. We try to learn about his blessed life, which is called the seerah. And we do all these things. Part of it is, yes, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to emulate His beautiful path and His beautiful teachings. And part, a part of that also, for many of us, becomes an encouragement and a yearning that we see Him in our dream. And it's not other than what attaches to love and the meanings of love. One who loves the Prophet Muhammad wasallam immensely and intensely wants to see him. Knowing that shaitan cannot impersonate the Prophet Muhammad. He can't take his form, right? He can't do anything to twist or uh, manipulate or to impersonate. So this is a great blessing from Allah because if that was the case, we would never be able to know if we truly saw the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And this is something really incredible if you really ponder it. Now, sometimes someone may see the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, but the form looks not what they would expect. The form is not what they would expect. And that is due to there is a meaning behind that. In other words, if you see the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and you, in your dream, you have an immense and a strong feeling, like you understand in the dream, this is the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, but there's something off in the description. Maybe he doesn't have a beard like he normally would. Maybe you see him in an older age, or a younger age, or in a certain state, one or another. The ulama mentioned that there is an interpretation in that dream. There is a message for you. There is a ta'wil. There is, an, there is a meaning, an interpretation to that dream, which then would require that you find a qualified scholar, a person that knows the interpretation of dreams. And we do know as Muslims, there are scholars that are qualified to interpret dreams. Muhammad ibn Sirin was one of the early scholars of the Salaf qualified to interpret dreams. He even has a book called the Book of Dreams. But we can't go to a book like that and say, Khalas, I had a dream, let me go to Muhammad ibn Sirin to see what it means. Because 
there is in, there is stories how two different people gave the exact same dream that they saw to Mo, uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Sidin and he gave two different interpretations because sometimes it depends who saw it what are their particular circumstances and it has sometimes different interpretations depending on who saw the dream now that is not to discourage you, but to inform you that this is not that simple. And it's not always that easy. However, seeing the Prophet Muhammad in your dream is one of the greatest blessings that you could be gifted with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because often, if you see the Prophet it is a glad tiding that inshallah, you're of those blessed to see him and blessed to inshallah be with him in paradise. We always want to stay, when I say stay humble, actually realize to be humble, because no one is to see the dream and wake up and say, Alhamdulillah, I saw the Prophet in my dream, I'm going to go to heaven, I'm going to go to Jannah. The companions who were given direct glad tidings from the Messenger of Allah, that they would be in paradise, when they were confronted and saying, People said to people like say Omar ibn Khattab, Omar, you were told you're going to go to paradise. What was his reaction? What was his answer? Often he would say, that is, if I die as a Muslim, can you guarantee me I'm going to die as a Muslim? Because the Muslim is always between hope and fear. We can never become too hopeful. That is a danger. And we can never have too much fear because... Fear without hope will lead into a state of despair, which then ultimately results in a person giving up on their faith, because that's ultimately what shaitan wants. One of the tricks of the devil is constantly to make religion too hard for you in your mind, because he wants to get you to give up. And also shaitan wants you to feel so secure in your religion to a point that you don't have any fear of Allah and it's just happy, happy. Everything is going to work out. You know, we're all going to heaven. What is there to worry about? You know, whoever says La ilaha illallah will enter Jannah. Whoever loves the Prophet will be with him, etc., etc. That becomes dangerous. And the way of our ulama and our scholars and the righteous is a way of balance. Sayyidina Omar said, even if one of my feet enter paradise, I will not be fully relaxed until the second foot is in paradise. We never want to become complacent. We never want to become too sure of ourselves, nor do we want, nor should we fall into a state of despair. Oh, I committed so many sins. Allah is not going to forgive me. What can I do? I feel like I'm never good enough. I feel like no matter what I do, I always fail. Maybe Islam, maybe I'm just not meant to be of those people to go to heaven. Maybe it's just meant in my taqdeer and my nasib and my destiny that I'm not of those people that will enter heaven. I'm just going to give up. Even if they don't say it, that's essentially what they are alluding to. And one of the toughest things to ever hear in your life is, no, you got to work for it. Toughen up. Don't become too complacent. Don't lose hope, but do what you're supposed to. Do what you're supposed to and be a person of balance. Here, just because you don't see the Prophet in your dream, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, does not mean you're not special. Does not mean you're not from the elite. There are great ulama and awliya that didn't see the Prophet sallallahu in their dream. Perhaps that was a state of intensification and their yearning for the messenger of Allah perhaps that was a reward for them a yearning such that as soon as they passed away they may have seen the Prophet ﷺ in their dream they may be united with him in the barzakh in the middle period where it is between this world and the day of judgment that middle period right the reasons Allah Ta'ala knows best and it may occur that someone who sees the Prophet ﷺ becomes too sure of themselves, becomes arrogant, walayadu billah, and ruins the blessedness of that experience. We should thank Allah for seeing the Prophet ﷺ in our dream. We should yearn to see him more. 
Yes, there have been people who saw him like every single night. And there are people that yearn to see him every single night. And there are Muslims amongst us that really are not connected at all. They're just like, I'm Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Yes, he's a prophet of God. I, I love him. But they don't go past that at all. They don't want to yearn to learn more about him. You know, they don't think about him much of the day. And even in their entire year, the Prophet ﷺ is not, unfortunately, unfortunately and sadly, he is not, and may Allah Ta'ala protect us and forgive us, and inshallah not make us of these people, but they don't keep him as the model to emulate. He is not their standard. Others are their standard. Movie stars are their standard. Singers and actors and actresses are their standard. Your modern, modern, most popular person on Instagram becomes their person they want to emulate. That's not for us as Muslims. Those are all khutuwat shaitan Those are all the footsteps of the devil. Those are dangerous, you know, dangerous places we can get trapped. May Allah Ta'ala protect us and save us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Bismillah. Inshallah, all comments, and uh, I see them, and inshallah, if there's any questions, we will definitely take them at the end. Also, I'd like to hear from you and your comments, your experiences on any of what we talk about. Inshallah, bismillah. Bismillah, the next hadith here relates to taking or claiming that which doesn't belong to one. Taking or claiming something that doesn't belong to one. Man idda'a ma laysa lahu falaysa minna wal yatabawwa maq'aduhu minan nar wa layadabillah. Whoever claims something not belonging to him is not of us. Let him take his seat in hellfire wa layadabillah. Now, in general as Muslims, and being that you are yearning to be an excellent person, truthfulness is very important. And this severe warning applies to someone who claims something not belonging to him while knowing that it is not his. So that's a lie. They're lying and they know it. It doesn't apply to one genuinely under the false impression that it belongs to him. And they're from not amongst us. فَلَيْسَ minna. This occurs a lot in many, many different hadiths. The scholars have different interpretation. Some of them have commented and saying that they're not from the real excellent group of Muslims. Some have said that it means that they're not from the Ma'ashar al-Ahl al-Jannah and those that will enter paradise at the get-go. Because even if you are a sinful Muslim, part of our aqidah and many hadiths that warn these things means that they will not enter heaven right away but that they will enter it after some time of basically in punishment. So there is absolute severe warning. And that's the balance we keep talking about, right? There's the balance of, there's a warning. And warnings are given throughout the Quran, throughout the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, his prophetic saying, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. those warnings are real and they are to get us to stay away from those things. So we don't fall into those sins. And if we do, we need to repent. For no sin is outside the forgiveness of Allah. So we have to repent. And at times, that repentance may require extra actions. And we've all mentioned that many, many a time in our lessons. But, you know, if you stole money, you have to return it. If you took the honor of somebody or you, you know... Um, said things about their character and disparaged them, you have to ask for their forgiveness and correct those wrongs. There are different things that follow up those sins. Here, this is a warning about theft and stealing. Though this is, in general, we think, eh, it's not really something you may be involved in, alhamdulillah. But this is something, subhanAllah, many people in our time who have properties, who have belongings, who are in the West and maybe their family is back home. This plays a really big role. People lie, people cheat and steal and do these things. And may Allah forgive them. And inshallah, this would not be the state of any 
righteous and true believing Muslim, but this is the reality. And we don't say it to say that we're better than the Mulayyad Billah, but this is the sad state that we find ourselves in. So uh, I would encourage myself and all of you to be upright in these things. Don't claim something doesn't belong to you. Uh, don't lie and be honorable and be truthful. And don't bear false witness to these things as well. There's a longer hadith that this attaches to, but inshallah, we're not going to read that uh, just for time and the content and the audience. Let's go to the next hadith, inshallah, and that is on fasting and its virtues. Again, in Zad al-Talibin, as we're going through these hadiths, this is the order that they keep coming up in, inshallah, not any particular. I know that when we see fasting and its virtues, this would be timely right before Ramadan. However, fasting is not only in Ramadan. This could be other times, but this one kind of restricted to Ramadan. Nonetheless, you can learn these things and reflect on them. This hadith reads, من صام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه ومن قام ليلة القدر إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan with belief and seeking reward, his previous sins will be forgiven. And whoever spends Laylatul Qadr, which could either be translated as the night of power or the night of destiny, the night of great worth basically is what it is. It has Qadr, it has a big worth and greatness with Allah. Standing in prayer with faith and seeking reward, his previous sins will be forgiven. Alhamdulillah, that's the blessed month of Ramadan. So those who fast, qama wa sama, those that stand and those that fasted, all their previous sins, inshallah, will be forgiven. Now when we talk about previous sins, unfortunately, and <laughs> this kind of comes up in many of the ulama, they always comment that this refers to minor sins. This refers to minor sins. Friday to Friday, Ramadan to Ramadan, Umrah to Umrah, all of these things, even one prayer to another, wipes off and all sins fall off. These are the minor sins. There's a big discussion on what is minor sin, what's a major sin, but these are all the minor sins. They would just fall off naturally. In al hasanat yudhibna sayyat, good deeds wipe away bad deeds. These are naturally just going to get erased. Bifadlillahi ta'ala, alhamdulillah. All these good deeds that you do naturally, prayer to prayer, Juma to Juma, Ramadan to Ramadan, Umrah, all these things fall off. The major sins that remain that require specific repentance. May Allah ta'ala forgive us and protect us. And it is part of the good character of a Muslim to every single day and really a lot of moments of the day if this happens and some, God forbid, you slip and you fall into a major sin, the best thing to do is to pray two rakats of Salat al tawbah and really repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't cut it at the base, if you don't attack and you know respond to that major sin right away, it may take a strong hold in our hearts, wa billah. And then you get used to that. And if you do that, then the heart dies. And that's a, that's a very serious thing. So um, there's a hadith that mentions that follow up a, good, uh, a bad deed with a good one. And it will erase it. So anytime you commit something wrong, right away, follow it up with a good deed. Like astaghfirullah, la ilaha illallah, subhanallah, right away. And it will erase it. And also because what if you died in that moment? So you did something wrong and then right away you said, La ilaha illallah. That's not a light matter. Saying La ilaha illallah and believing it is the greatest of all deeds. right? Belief in Allah, renewing our faith. That's significant. And think about it. Had Allah Ta'ala not desired to forgive you, He wouldn't have even allowed you to say La ilaha illallah after that. The very fact that you're able to say La ilaha illallah, Astaghfirullah, Rabbi wa tubu ilayk, or, you know, dua, Sayyid Istighfar. This is another dua that I highly encourage myself and all of you to recite daily. Dua Sayyid Istighfar, which is translated as the chief 
or the master of all supplications for asking for forgiveness, right? And you can find that in many litanies of the scholars, where the Latif has it of Imam al-Haddad. Many collections have it. Imam Nawawi Zathkar, and many, many others. Those that took our class on du'as and supplications, we put that up on a slide, and you can refer that and take that class as well. And inshallah, if you're in any of our classes here registered and you put that, we'll definitely get you that text, inshallah. Our next hadith that comes in this succession is about prayers and congregation. Prayers and congregation. <clears throat> and it seems we actually, let me just go back one. Um, excellence with others actually comes first. So what is this hadith? This hadith starts with Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir. Now, usually when we have these hadiths that starts with Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir, there's a great emphasis and an importance to what is being said. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day. Well, that's a very important thing. It's bringing emphasis. It's stressing to us the importance of what is about to be said. So one should magnify what is being said and then apply it in their life. So what is the first one? Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir fal yukrim dayfahu. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day should be hospitable to his guests, should honor his guests. Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir fala yu'zi jarahu. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day should not harm or trouble his neighbor. And whoever believes in Allah in the last day should either speak what is good or remain silent. Or remain silent. Now, these things are important. Honoring the guest has its great reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is something the Arabs were actually very well known for. Someone who came as a guest says, I'm your guest. They honored and took care of them for three days. They didn't ask them why they're here. They didn't ask them for things like, uh, you know, and if you take our class, The Pursuit of Noble Character, we went through a book by the noble scholar, Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghuda rahimahullah ta'ala. And part of the excellence of how you honor your guest is that which is best exemplified and shown to us an example by Sayyidina Ibrahim. When he had two of the angels who took the form of men and came to him and he saw that there was a guest without asking him, are you hungry? Would you like something to eat? Do you want some water? These are things you shouldn't really ask a guest. He went right away and he sacrificed an animal, I think it was a calf, uh, a, a small cow, and barbecued it basically, cooked it, and brought it before them. That's high level of excellence with your guest. This is what Muslims were known for. Honor your guest. And Sheikh Abdul Fatah in there just really briefly mentions about everything from the adab and the etiquette of putting a towel, indicating to them where the qibla is, you know, facilitating all things for the guest such that the guest is not uncomfortable to ask for anything, right? Show them everything, where they're going to sleep, the qibla, give them the thing to pray on, um, the bathroom, the towels, and, you know, give them water, leave everything that they could possibly need in order for them to be comfortable. And when you feel very honored as a guest, this is excellent character. This is ihsan. This is why it's titled here, Excellence with Others. The second, which is don't harm your neighbor. Neighbor, Don't trouble your neighbor. Neighbors are extremely important in Islam, and it doesn't have anything to do with whether your neighbor is a Muslim or not a Muslim. If they are Muslim, they have double rights on you. That one of a Muslim, but two as a, as a neighbor. But even if they're not Muslim, they're still your neighbor. And there's so many stories of the righteous. And in that book, The Pursuit of Noble Character, there's also a section about neighbors. 
to a point that it said that the neighbor has so much rights and Sayyidina Jibreel advised the Prophet Sallallahu on neighbors so much to a point that he said, I thought they might inherit from us. Meaning that they're just like family and they have rights to your wealth after in Wiratha. Stressing the importance of how important it is to treat the neighbor kindly and not to harm them. It is said that if you want to know your state with Allah, see what your neighbor says about you. If your neighbor says you're a good person, it means you are good. But if the neighbor has a lot of complaints about you, it means that you have a, basically, you're a bad believer that needs a lot of work. So neighbors are very important and neighbors have a right. And also the courtesy with that goes with neighbors. The ulama mentioned, you know, pass off a lot of things about neighbors that would generally bother you. If they're minute things, and, you know, forgive them, overlook it. Right? If they're doing something like playing something loud, overlook it. Right? Forgive them for many of these things, and Allah Ta'ala will forgive you, and you'll get a reward from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. There's stories of the righteous, Imam Sayyidina Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu. He had a neighbor that would you know, party and listen to music and do all these other things, and when he got locked up and went to jail, Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu went and bailed him out and helped him he said, why would you do this when I harm you so much? He said, you're my neighbor, you have rights. And that, that was a cause of the man to repent. And he even became one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anh. We don't do that just because we're trying to get people to convert, we're trying to get people to be, you know. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. It's the excellence that we should embody because our Prophet sallallahu he did that and he encouraged us to do it as well. And the third of the element of this is that either you should, you, sh you should speak what is good or remain silent. And as Muslims, we should know the character of our Prophet wasallam. that he didn't speak much except when there was a benefit. The Prophet Sallallahu often remained silent and the times that he spoke was because there was a need and a benefit to it. And he didn't speak much. Whatever he spoke was very limited in actual words in the number of words so i think that leaves us enough to reflect on our next hadith here now is about prayers and congregation prayers and congregation man salla man salla man salla al isha fi jama'a isha fi jama'atin fa ka'anna maqam nisf al layl وَمَنْ صَلَّى الصُّبْحَ فِي جَمَاعَةٍ فَكَأَنَّمَا صَلَّى اللَّيْلَ كُلَّهُ If anyone performs the night prayers, the Isha prayers in congregation, it is as though he has spent the half the night in standing in prayer. And if anyone performs the morning Fajr prayer in congregation, it is as though he has spent the whole night in prayer. Now this is part of the Fadl and the Bounty and the Barakah of the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How much how many times do we hear about the rewards for something that you do that is so little, yet Allah gives so much reward for it? Because of the name of Allah and that which attaches to the meanings of ash-shakur, right? The appreciative one. The one who you do a little, but he rewards you immensely. That is the generosity of our Lord. This is the barakah of the chosen one and his blessed ummah. You pray five times a day, but Allah gives you the reward of the 50. You pray the night prayer in jama'ah. This is mostly and specifically speaking about men in congregation in a masjid. And Allah Ta'ala gives them half the night in reward. Sisters who just pray at home, they're getting already the incredible reward that outdoes all of this. They get the full reward themselves. This is something tremendous. And if you follow that up with fajr in jama'ah, you get the whole night in prayer. And if you go to a gathering of knowledge, inshallah Allah make this lesson of ours a gathering of knowledge, inshallah, and grant you all the reward of tuning in and listening for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ameen. If you do that, then a single gathering of knowledge is better than 60 years of worship. The reward is beyond our imagination. What is all? That is all from the barakah and the fadl. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the chosen nation of the chosen prophet, the best of mankind and the best of all people brought forward, which is the Muslims. Alhamdulillah. 
for the blessing of Islam. Alhamdulillah, for all these gifts that Allah Ta'ala showers and manifests upon all of us, yet few amongst the servants of Allah are in a state of gratitude. So we should say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Allah make us amongst the grateful Ya Rabbil Alameen. The next hadith is something about on the lines of lineage and good deeds. Lineage and good deeds. And this is part of a longer hadith. مَنْ بَطَّأَ بِهِ عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ Whoever's actions set him back, his ancestry will not hasten him forward. Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has the most taqwa, right? Most taqwa. Human beings will only get that which they worked on, that which they strive for. Allah ta'ala will reward people based on the amount of deeds that they did and having noble intentions is from that. But sometimes, you know, especially in with the Arabs in the old days and among some who use this to misappropriately understand this, that, you know, if they think they have a certain lineage, that, hey, this is going to help them on the Day of Judgment. No, it does not. Actions and what you do and what you put forward to Allah Ta'ala, this is what's going to matter. Now, there is something to be said about having noble people in your lineage that may make or, or perform shafa for you, intercession, that is there. So if you come from a noble family of righteous people, the righteousness of your ancestry may be a benefit. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah Ta'ala mentions about the orphan where Sayyidina Al-Khidr salam built a wall for a group of people that were angry or, or, or treated them uh, you know, in a very, um, didn't treat them very kindly, he built for a wall for them. And the people that took him across in the boat, he destroyed their boat. And part of the reason was, Allah Ta'ala mentions, and their forefather was righteous. So our actions will affect our children and our grandchildren, etc. But that is not what you want to rely upon and say that, okay, you know, I come from a noble family, I have nothing to worry about. That's not what's going to get you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an honorable state and in a state where you will be successful. Our next hadith, it's a very short one. Man kana lahu sha'run falyukrimhu. Whoever has hair should groom it. There's so many people out there that cut hair. There's so many people out there that are dentists. There's so many people out there that are doctors. Subhanallah, when you look at the life and the sayings of the Prophet sallallahu he didn't leave anything out. Even something like whoever has hair should honor it, should groom it, should take care of it. In the Shamail of Imam At-Tirmidhi, it mentions that the Prophet ﷺ often used to put oil in his blessed hair. He would take care of it. He would put oil and he would put on his turban. Sometimes it would have so much oil that it would drip from his blessed Mubarak hair onto his blessed Mubarak shoulders. And that is from the excellence of presentation, that we do that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not be in a state where you're disheveled, you're not well kept, you're, you don't dress appropriately, you just look like you're not very presentable. And the Prophet Sallallahu amongst the few things that he used to keep, one is a comb that he would keep himself you know, groomed always and presentable. He had a miswak, the siwak, which he would clean his blessed teeth, which was mubarak, and shining like white pearls, and spaced perfectly, a perfect sized mouth that was able to articulate and pronunciate with absolute excellence. His fasaha and the way he used to speak and his eloquence was of absolute perfection, needed to be to recite the ayat and the Qur'an and to speak to the various people from Arab tribes and others that would come to learn about Islam. 
But this is his sunnah and his practice, and it was the practice and the way of the scholars to show that excellence. Our dress should be for Allah, and Allah commands us to do that out of love and for Allah Ta'ala, and the sunnah and the practice of the righteous. Attaches to this are some other really important points in general about Muslims and being Muslims and hygiene. The fact that we should not be people that smell bad. It makes people repelled from us. Why do we perform ghusl before we go to Salat al Jummah? So that we don't annoy somebody who's trying to think about God and they can't because you, you have a smell that emits that is not very pleasant. This is why we take a shower. In the Maliki Madhab, it is specifically recommended to make the ghusl right before you're on your way to Jummah. And you apply scent for men, oils, something that makes you very presentable. This is all that some scholars mentioned, these sunnas, ghusl, oil, you know, going to Juma, not separating between people, listening attentively, is all attached to the sins of the whole week being forgiven. So dressing well, smelling nicely, smelling, you know, pleasant, pleasantly, and looking presentable and excellent as we're supposed to wear the best of our clothing to Salat al Juma, not jeans and a t-shirt, not just you know, something you find and you throw on. It's not steamed. It's not ironed. It doesn't look presentable. You don't show like you have a lot of care to be in the masajid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wear your more, most excellent clothing. And you do that for Allah. Allah, loves, Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. The sunnah of the Prophet is beautiful. His presentation and all things were excellent. The Prophet ﷺ had a jubba. A thobe that would open up and he specifically wore it on the days of Friday for Salat al Jummah. This is also a, ma- a showing and demonstrating that we honor and we show gratitude for this great day of Jummah, Friday, which is the best day of the entire week. We should be very happy with Fridays. Imam al Haddad and other ulama mentioned even to separate a good amount of your day for worship because it's such an excellent day. So many rewards are attached to it. Also, while on this topic about grooming yourself, taking care of your hair, taking care of your hygiene, it's important to highlight, brothers and sisters, something that you may not often hear, especially that you're young, that there are certain things that go with being in a state of hygiene and they are important and they should be observed within every 40 days. And to leave them off more than 40 days in the Hanafi madhab becomes prohibitively disliked, which means you're committing a sin. Which means basically it is not permissible. And part of those things are that one clips their nails of their feet and their hand within ideally weekly. And that you remove from under your arms all hair for both men and women. These are things for both men and women. That you remove the armpit hair from your body. And that you remove all hair, pubic hair around the private parts from the surrounding area. All of it should be removed weekly and not to exceed more than 40 days. That may seem a little embarrassing for some, but this there's no embarrassment nor shyness in teaching the religion and learning the religion. And it's actually from a disease of the heart. In Matharat al-Qulub, one of the diseases of the heart is blameworthy shyness to such a point where people don't talk about these things and people don't learn about these things. As a result, it is neglected. And the women of Medina used to ask the Prophet ﷺ about their menstruation to an extreme detail. To such a point where one time he told Sayyidina Aisha to go in, inform them. Because it went past a certain level. <laughs> right? But that was a good thing because they wanted to learn their religion. And so, also, 
Um, and that's for the men as well to trim their mustache such that their mustache doesn't go over their lips. And there's different scholarly interpretation of what it means to trim the mustache. But the agreement there would be from the extent of what I know, Wallahu ta'ala alam, is that it shouldn't go over the lips like the old Persians did. Until today they do that. They just grow this long, very ugly mustache, in my opinion, over their lips completely. And this is khilaf is sunnah. This is the Prophet ﷺ once saw that in a man and turned his blessed face from him. And when asked why, he said, who told you to do this? He said, our leader in Persia. He said, what an evil thing that he's commanded you. My Lord commanded me to grow my beard and to trim my mustache. That is from the beauty, from the handsomeness of a man is his beard. Glory be to the one who made men handsome by their beard and women by their braids. This is old. <laughs> Maybe what seems to be lost in our time, this is from the fitra, the natural disposition of a human being. This is when things were healthy in our societies. This is from what was natural and what appealed naturally as beautiful. In a time now that there, everything is upside down. So these are important things. These are important things. May Allah Ta'ala bless you and I to follow this beautiful sunnah. Our next hadith is about an accepted hajj. Hajj that is accepted from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala called hajj mabrur. Man hajja lillahi falam, yarf, falam yarfath walam yafsuq raja'a ka yawmin waladathu ummuhu. He who performs the pilgrimage for Allah without engaging in immodest talk or transgression will return, meaning free from sin, as, on, as if on the day his mother gave him birth. Meaning, he returns back like a newborn. A newborn baby has no sins recorded against him. The pen is lifted on three. The young child until they reach the age of puberty. There's no sins counted against them. Such is the state of a person who comes back. May Allah bless and preserve one of my teachers. I was just talking to him earlier this morning who just returned from Hajj. And, you know, the, anybody who returned from Hajj, you should get their du'as and their prayers because their prayers are accepted. And their prayers are accepted and for the one that they pray for, for their forgiveness is accepted. And this is something we should all yearn. It's a pillar of Islam to perform the hajj and many people neglect it until a very old age and that becomes very dangerous may allah tabaraka wa ta'ala allow us all to visit mecca al mukarrama medina al munawwara visit the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi and perform the hajj the last hadith of tonight inshallah that we will cover bismillah this is also part of a longer hadith but this one is at talibin idha sarratka hasanatuka when your good deeds make you happy or rejoiced and your bad deeds make you sad or worried, then you are a believer. Then you are a believer. Now, sometimes we take these things that we are blessed with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granted. This is part, the beginning of this hadith in some narrations is a person came and asked the Prophet Sallallahu what is faith? Mal iman. What is faith? And he mentioned this, that when your good deeds please you and your evil deeds grieve you or make you sad, then you're a believer. A believer, when they perform good deeds and makes them happy, this is a sign, what they call alamatul iman. These are signs of a person's faith because they know that there is the day of judgment. There is going to be rewards. There is going to be accounting for the wrongs that they did. And nadam, which is remorse and sadness, this is from the greatest alvam arkana tawbah. This is from the most important pillar of repenting to Allah, feeling bad about your sins. A tawbah is nadama. Tawbah and to turn to Allah Ta'ala and ask for forgiveness is 
to regret what you have done for the sake of Allah. And rejoicing in your good deeds, why are you rejoicing? Because you're rejoicing that Allah Ta'ala will be pleased with you. You're rejoicing that Allah will reward you from it, which is a sign of faith. Because the hypocrite and the person doesn't believe in Allah, they don't care about the sins they're committing. It doesn't affect them at all. There's no movement in the heart. There's no consequences. There's no consequence. There's no distinction being able to differentiate between good and bad. It doesn't affect them at all. But the believer... They have something that Allah Ta'ala gave them as a tool to be able to recognize that. And a deep secret in the heart that makes the heart move and affected by good, that it pleases you. And this is why once that the Prophet Sallallahu was asked by the companions, Ya Rasulullah, sometimes we get a thought that is so bad we dare not even utter it. He said that is from faith. Not that the bad thoughts that are coming, this is from faith. But they said, we don't even want to mention it. In other words, they hate that that thought occurs to them. Where is the hate coming from? The hate is coming from the source of faith. And this is from shaitan. That brings up an evil thought. Evil thoughts that come in your brain is no sign that you do not believe. Rather, the fact that it bothers you and it disturbs you, is a sign of your faith. Is a sign of your faith. That's what we rejoice in. Look at all the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at all the gifts that Allah ta'ala has given this blessed ummah of the Prophet Muhammad. We thank Allah for these gifts. Walilah alhamd. And inshallah with that we conclude this lesson. Bidnillah. We have um, bidnillah, three more lessons and we will conclude this class, inshallah, on short hadith for youth. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, at this point, we'd like to pause and see if there's any comments or questions. Bidnillah, we'll give you a couple minutes to go ahead and ask those questions, inshallah. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and post them, bidnillah. Regarding the hadith about grooming the hair, are women allowed to remove facial hair and other hair on their limbs other than their pubic hair? Yes, they're allowed. There's nothing wrong with that, depending on their intention. And their intention is that which is excess and that which doesn't harm. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. There is discussion that uh, revolves around the eyebrows in particular. And there's some warnings and there's some nuance there and there's some rulings there. So if you like to look up a detailed discussion on that, there's some discussion between the Shafis and the Hanafis on that, inshallah you can go ahead and Google these questions right off of Seeker's Guidance and you'll find, mashallah, tabarakallah, excellent resource and detailed answer on that. But in short, yes, it is allowed. Um. I'm not sure that I, I've never heard that. Um, I think that scholars are in agreement in not allowing hair on the private regions, that that needs to be cut in the Hanafi every within 40 days, not to exceed. I think that that would require that you cite where that is mentioned, etc. I'm not aware of any of anything near like that. Any other questions? What is the status of wearing white specifically for Yom al Juma? Um, 
Wallahu ta'ala anam, there are narrations that encouraged the general wearing of white colors. It was a general encouragement. I do not know of it specifically for the day of Friday. Wallahu alam, something inshallah that we can look at. Yeah. This this would require some looking into inshallah for the day of Friday. That which the Prophet sallallahu wore is always encouraged. We'd have to look at the shamail of the uh, Imam Tirmidhi to look at more detail. Excellent questions. Wallahu ta'ala adam. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Now, mashallah, you know, if you have a sheikh that encourages that and he studied, then that sounds legit. So, inshallah, you can you can refer to your sheikh and uh, follow that. Um, Disposing of uh, something you find later that has haram ingredients, can we give that to a non-Muslim? In general, the opinion, there might be a difference of opinion. Do check this on Seeker's Guidance, inshallah. If something does not, if something does have a haram ingredient in it, this is considered to be najis and uh, filthy, especially if it has like alcohol or pig and stuff like that. One should not give it to anybody, but there might be difference of opinion. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu feekum jami'an. Inshallah, I pray that this class was beneficial. Um, no problem inshallah there's always recordings and those that have registered inshallah do register and can get extra uh, resources and these questions that you ask will definitely get to them and answer them this is part of the benefit of registering inshallah um, jazakumullahu khairan any last question we'll take one more question if there's any questions inshallah Allah ibarak fikum. I appreciate everyone's du'as. May Allah bless you all more. Have uh, those kept up, inshallah? Have you been able to memorize some of the hadiths? The beginning when we started in part one of this class, there was supposed to be an encouragement to memorize at least 40 hadith. In the beginning, shorter ones were the, the shortest that were um, easier to memorize and easier to go after and to try to memorize. So um, do try to make effort. Uh, in trying to memorize those that yearn for higher levels, inshallah, learn the shorter hadith and memorize them. Mashallah. MashaAllah, good. Zakmalahu khairan. There is actually a tradition that mentions to wear white clothes. So there's absolutely encouragement. I think I mentioned that. But in particular, yes, there is. Otherwise, we wouldn't have seen that as such a practice everywhere. 
white represents a type of purity, mashallah. Tayyib, jazakum Allahu khairan for everyone watching, inshallah. We'll see you all next time. Barakallahu feekum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.